All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we've got an exciting uh, visitor today. Um, today, we are happy to welcome Dr. Wilfried Mullins, and I'd just like to take a moment to uh, introduce him. Uh, Dr. Mullins received his degree in cardiology as well as cardiac rehabilitation in Belgium in 2005. Uh, he then graduated as advanced fellow in uh, heart failure and transplant in 2007, as well as a fellow in electrical therapies for heart failure in 2008 at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he received his doctor of philosophy or PhD at Technical University Eindhoven in the Netherlands in 2009. And currently is a staff cardiologist in the, I'm gonna but butcher this name probably, but it's Hospital Oost Limburg Genk uh, in Belgium. And also is an associate professor in the School of Medicine and Life Sciences at the University of Hasselt in, Bel in Belgium. Uh, Dr. Mullins is a heart failure clinician with a strong commitment to translational research, uh, translating new me mechanistic insights into answering questions of clinical interests. His main research topics are cardiac resynchronization therapy, as well as the cardiorenal interactions with, and he's published more than 270 peer reviewed publications. Uh, he's been the president of the Belgian Working Group on Heart Failure and serving as a board member of the European Heart Failure Association. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Mullins, thank you again for taking the time to join us, and uh, we look forward to hearing you speak. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's already evening here in Belgium, but thank you for the introduction um, and for the invitation. And also hi to uh, Jeff and Erin, um, which I get to know already for a couple of years. I'm going to talk a little bit about ad for, but I'm trying to introduce ad for a little bit. And I'm, I'm a heart failure specialist, I think just like many of you, but sometimes I think I should have been a nephrologist. Um, we do a lot of research in, in my center. It's of course not me who is doing this. I'm fortunate that I have a lot of really excellent PhD fellows who joined me over the last decade. And most of the times we have two PhD fellows who are really, uh, really active to try to investigate um, everything that Michael just alluded to with regards to cardiorenal interactions and resynchronization therapy. So I, I don't have to tell you that congestion is a uh, risk factor for hospitalization and all-cause mortality, but I think most of our colleagues don't take this for granted, that the risk is up to 20% in the two years in ambulatory patients and goes up to 60% in one year, especially if we send our patients home with ongoing congestion. That's why we put in our HFA guidelines, but also you did it in HFSA guidelines, that congestion needs to be treated aggressively, identified early on to prevent further um, adverse outcomes. And I think one of the first people who actually noticed this was Greg Fonero. I don't think he ever published this data. This was from an abstract where he showed that a reduction in left-sided filling pressures was more important than an improvement in cardiac output in patients who came into the hospital with low cardiac output. Um, if you look at the kidney, uh, the kidney gets a tremendous amount of blood, almost one liter per minute. So it's not a surprise that also the kidney depends on central hemodynamics. We, but also other people just like Jeff have shown that also for the kidney perspective, reducing central venous pressure, so filling pressures for the kidney is more important than improving forward flow to the kidney. And so if you have an elevated central venous pressure, this is really associated with worsening renal function in patients who are admitted with heart failure, but it's also associated with more sodium and water retention. We done an animal experiment a couple of years ago where we did a selective partial ligation of the vena cava inferior in rats. It was a pretty difficult experiment, to be honest, because we had to intubate these rats and it's not so easy to intubate a rat. But anyway, if you do that and you increase the central venous pressure just selectively in the abdomen, not touching even the heart, you see that already after a couple of weeks that there are irreversible changes to the glomeruli of these rats. So elevated central venous pressure is really a bad thing to happen uh, for your kidneys. One slide about chronic heart failure, and bear in mind that you lose about one ml per GFR per year once you reach the age of 50. This goes up to 2.5 mLs if you have heart failure and up to five if you have diabetes, which is uncontrolled. That is why we have to do our utmost best to stop this deterioration. And for chronic heart failure, the best two drugs that we have available are ARNI and SGLT2. 
And CKD is a far more stronger predictor than ejection fraction for prognosis. So halting this deterioration is really important. That's only, the only thing I'm gonna say about chronic heart failure. Now, if you look back at the kidney, uh, the kidney is a very long tubule. And the reason for the tubal to be very long is that we need to filter a lot. We need to filter about 100 cc's of water, sodium, and toxic substances. And of that 100 cc, which is filtered, all, only one cc per minute actually is produced as urine. All the other 99% will be reabsorbed in the tubules. But we need that 100 cc's to filter to, in, order, in order to excrete all the toxic substances that are body is producing. Bear in mind that most of the water and sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal parts of the kidney, and that is really exaggerated if you have heart failure. I know Jeff doesn't agree with me on that, but I'm going to show him later that I am correct and he is wrong. <laughs> um, if you look at normal human beings, bear also in mind that you absorb every bit of sodium that you eat in your gut. We cannot lose sodium in our guts because we have a very high brass activity. And this resides from the fact that we used to be um, lizards and then, then we didn't really have access to sodium. And then we were upstanding in an upright position. So we need high pressures. And that's the reason why we have a very activated RAS system. Uh, <clears throat> now, when you eat, um, every day one bag of potato chips uh, with salt, you will see that you have an increased natriuresis, which is hampered if you have heart failure, but over time, you'll have a positive sodium balance. So that means that the problem of heart failure doesn't only stop with the kidney, but it starts with the kidney. And we have a problem there because we have a positive sodium balance also if you don't have heart failure. And most people don't really realize that, that it's not like, everything that you're gonna eat will be excreted in your kidneys. So it made us think, uh, made us look at, 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 at the renal physiologist that you know really well, <clears throat> I mean also from Yale, where he actually um, assessed that there are stores where you can actually hide sodium. And we took it one step further in heart failure patients. And we found out that there is also a lot of sodium hiding in the skin. And if you do skin biopsies in heart failure patients, you see more of these structures in heart failure. And you also see a very activated RAS system in patients with heart failure. We're actually trying to prospectively assess this by giving heart failure patients additional sodium and doing serial skin biopsies to see if the skin actually reacts in, uh, in the face of a different sodium loading. Well, anyway, coming back to acute heart failure, eventually we'll have more sodium and water retention. Our bodies cannot accommodate that. We'll have an increase in plasma volume. And the higher the plasma volume, the higher the likelihood that that patient will be admitted with heart failure. If you have a patient with acute heart failure, the guidelines tell us that we should give them loop diuretic therapy. In the HFA guidelines published in 2021, loop diuretics is the only therapy with a class one recommendation independent of the ejection fraction to treat congestion. This of course will change with the SGLT2 inhibitors, but in 2021, it was the only drug with a class one recommendation uh, to treat signs of congestion. Now bear in mind that we don't really have much data to support this with a class one recommendation. And the only prospective randomized double-blind trial with loop diuretics was the DOSE trial. The DOSE, as you know, was comparing continuous versus bolus, low versus high dose, rosamide, so four different treatment strategies. The primary endpoint was neutral. And when you looked at the secondary endpoints of all-cause mortality and heart flare rehospitalization, the risk was up to, six to, up to 50% at two months. So half of the patients in those were, were either dead or back in the hospital after two months. So not a really good result, to be really honest. And when you looked at what re, uh, investigators were reporting, freedom from congestion after three days was only 15%. So only one out of six of the patients included in those was dry at the end of the study period. There are many reasons for that. But also bear in mind that if you give loop teratics in monotherapy, 
Right. On the left, you see the urinary volume per 40 milligrams of furosemide. And on the right, you see the urinary sodium and chloride contents over three consecutive days. So what this slide actually shows is that you have a decrease in sodium content while you have a similar urinary output. It means that the quality of the urine is dramatically changing if you only give loop uretic therapy over three consecutive days. And bear this in mind when we're gonna talk about ED4. So this is a slide from Jeff. Uh, normally, if you give 40 milligrams of furosemide to a normal human being, you should be peeing out about three liters of water and sodium and almost none of our heart failure patients are doing that, especially if they are already on a loop diuretic. There are many reasons for that, but the main reason is that loop diuretics work distal. They work at the loop of Henle, which is distal from the site where most sodium is reabsorbed. And we're trying to overcome that. So we tried to write a document a couple of years ago, how we can better uh, guide Use usage of loop diuretic therapy. It's one of the most cited articles in the European Journal of Heart Failure that has almost more than 200,000 downloads because it has a lot of very practical flow charts. I'm going to just go very quickly over five of the most important rules. First of all, door to diuretic time. There's no reason to wait to give loop diuretic therapy to any patient who comes in with congestion. But the most important rule is that you have to evaluate the effect of the loop diuretic within hours after you gave the diuretic. Loop diuretics work for about six to eight hours maximum. So you should evaluate the effect within hours after you gave the diuretic. And we proposed to look at natriuresis. So take a urinary sample, send it to the lab, and if it's below 50 mex per liter, it means that you will never reach your goals and that you should increase the dose of the loop diuretic already after eight hours. Only stop when the patient is dry and continue guidance directed medical therapy if possible. We actually incorporated this flow chart, identically the same flow chart now in our uh, ESC guidelines as a guidance to use loop diuretic therapy better. So this is not in Europe just a suggestion, it's really a recommendation now that you should use a naturesis guided approach to improve the utilization of loop diuretic therapy. We're actually testing this algorithm now prospectively in every continent outside the United States in more than 26 centers. And I can already can tell you that the results are really spectacular. Now, what, is, what may be the future for uh, loop diuretic? It may be subcutaneous furosemide. There was a small um, observational study presented at HFA this year where the investigators in Scotland infused during five hours 30 milligrams of furosemide. The, in, in the first hour, and afterwards 12.5 milligrams. And what they actually showed is that they could evoke more naturoresis and diuresis also with a sub -Q pump. This is now been this is now currently being tested in a prospective trial in patients who are outpatient to try to prevent a hospitalization. And it's then given by heart failure nurses in an outpatient setting in Scotland. Now, what is the other option if your if loop directs fail to do the job? It might be thiazides. And thiazides work also distal and nephron. I know you're all. all really fond of thiazides. Uh, you know they might counterbalance with distal hypertrophy. They work in low GFR states, but they have a slow GI absorption. So you have to give them hours before you give the loop diuretic. As Jeff also showed that uh, if you give long-term thiazides, they are linked with an increased mortality, which is probably related to a higher likelihood of IN disturbances. Uh, you, you, you know that if you give this long-term all these patients develop hyponatremia and hypokalemia. So thiazides are a drug that can be used short-term to improve decongestion, but should not be used long-term because they are linked to a worse outcome. Now, there has been the chlorotic trial. Chlorotic was a Spanish randomized double-blind trial done uh, over the last six years where investigators compared placebo with hydrochlorothiazide for three days in patients with acute heart failure their primary endpoint was weight loss, and they showed that more weight loss in the hydrochlorothiazide group. 
The paper has not been published yet, but it has been presented at HFA a couple of months ago. I think everybody's waiting for the paper to, to appear somewhere, but so far it's not uh, been uh, published. The other option that you might think of is high dose spinal lactone. So this was tested in the TINA trial, 25 versus 100 milligrams. It did not show a reduction in anti-pro BMP. It also did not show an increase in diuresis. So spinal lactone is extremely important as a disease modifying agent, but it's not an agent that will help you to decongest patients easier. The reason for all of that is in my mind that all these agents work distal really distal from the site where most sodium is reabsorbed. That is the proximal part. And the oldest drug that we had to improve the uh, naturesis that works in the proximal parts of the kidneys is cetazolamide. Cetazolamide is a carbon anhydrase inhibitor. It blocks there for the uptake of sodium. It interferes with the sodium proton exchanger and which is responsible for more than 60% of the sodium reabsorption in the proximal parts of the kidney. We've done a small prospective randomized double-blind trial almost a decade ago where we com compared acetazolamide plus loop diuretics with loop diuretics only in acute heart failure. And in that small trial, we showed an, an almost a doubling of the natriuresis in, a, 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 I think it was like 80 patients. This was the rationale to develop the ED4 trial. And ED4 stands for acetazolamide in decompensated heart failure patients with volume overload. This is uh, just to show if there are fellows around. It took us uh, almost six years to conduct the trial. Uh, we needed about 2 million euros. It's a little bit more than you can get from any yeah, sponsor. So we had to beg to the healthcare authorities to get the money. There was absolutely zero company interested to give us the money, but it's a lot of work if you want to do a trial like this. And we were aiming high because we thought the only way to, to prove to Jeff Destani that this drug would work is to do a double-blind, randomized, prospective, multi-center trial. But that's not so easy to accomplish. We had a trial steering committee uh, with a lot of... Uh, international and famous people from Europe. We had 29 participating sites only in Belgium. We only recruited it in Belgium because it was the Belgian healthcare authorities who were gonna pay for the trial. And they did, they did not allow us to go abroad. Patient recruitment. So we estimated that we would finish finalize the trial within two years. We needed 519 patients. It took us three years because of course of COVID. Eh? During the first COVID wave, everything stopped and we did almost the same in the second COVID wave. We also do, have done a biomarker sub-study. If any of you is interested, we collected um, blood samples, urine samples in about 130 patients. And this was also a lot of work because we didn't have funding for that. So when I was on call at 1 a.m. in the morning, I was actually taking blood samples to, to, to put in the biobank. The budget was 2.2 million. Uh, it's not so much for a trial which is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but it's still a lot of money. Uh, it's actually the money that you need if you want to do a trial like this. So what was the trial design? Again, prospective multi-center randomized academic trial, no industry funding. I can actually tell you we reached out to one of the companies that made acetazolamide, uh, but they had absolutely zero interest. And then I asked them, you know, can we get 10,000 vials of acetazolamide, which is a powder? And they said, sure, you can get it. So I asked them, can we get them for free? And they said, no. <laughs> anyway, so we paid for everything. What was the inclusion criteria? It was a pragmatic trial. So we wanted the patients to be admitted with acute heart failure with at least one sign of volume overload, had them on the legs and or pleural effusion and or ascites. Since um, we were aiming high, we, we demanded to the investigators that if they would say there was pleural effusion or ascites, that that needed to be confirmed by a technical exam. So they had to do an ultrasound or radi radiography of the, of the chest or an ultrasound of the abdomen to actually confirm that there was fluid present. Patients needed to be at least one month on maintenance therapy of oral loop diuretics and their anti PEs needed to be above 1,000. We needed the sample size of 519 to detect an absolute risk reduction of 
absolute there. We're not talking about relative risk here. We're talking about absolute risk reduction. So this is a really clinical benefit, a 10% absolute risk reduction that came down to 66% of rel relative risk reduction. And we base ourselves upon dose, and in the dose, since the control group in ad for was really comparable with dose, we estimated that the likelihood of decongestion was 15% in the control group, and we hoped that the cetazolamide would push that up to 25%. So we trained the investigators to fill in this congestion score comprised of edema, pleural effusion, and ascites. Patients were deemed to be dry if they have a congestion score of less or equal to one. The trial was really pragmatic. So what, what were we comparing? Three days loop diuretic therapy, twice the home dose intravenously plus placebo versus three days, same amount of loop diuretic therapy, twice the home dose every day, plus 500 milligrams of acetazolamide. The primary endpoint was successful decongestion after three days. So meaning, is your patient dry if you use this diuretic strategy after three days? So the control group was almost like dose, and the intervention group was dose plus 500 milligrams of acetazolamide. Bear in mind again that this primary endpoint is clinically very relevant because it's a class one recommendation in our HF guidelines. If you look at the baseline characteristics of patients included in, in ad 4 they were really similar. They were 78 years of age, ejection fraction mean was 43%, two thirds that have PEF, one third that have REF, median NP pro BNP were 6,000. So these were elderly patients with a lot of comorbidities. And this is what we're seeing in Europe. I don't know about the US, but this is exactly what we're seeing in Europe. 78 years of age, anti pro 6,000, poor renal function. That's just what we're seeing. This is where our emergency rooms are flooding. It. We have the same in the Swedish HF registry, which is the registry in Sweden. We have the same in the European registries in heart failure elderly people with a lot of comorbidities. If you look at their congestion score, they all had severe edema on their legs, about 60% of the pleural effusion and 10% had ascites. When we compared ourselves with the other aforementioned trials, those Athena and Caress, Caress was an ultrafiltration versus step pharmacological diuretic therapy. We could see that patients were old or elder in F4, we're more on MRAs and at higher anti-pro BNPs. Just reflective of a pragmatic trial. This is really a pragmatic trial, including patients that we're seeing in daily clinical life. This is the, was the primary endpoint. In the placebo group, it was 30%. And this was a worry for us because the only thing that we knew a little bit during the trial, it was double blind, of course, was that there seemed to be more patients dry than what we had anticipated because we had anticipated 15%. So if it was 30%, we knew that the absolute risk reduction should even be higher, otherwise we could never reach statistical significance. But we were lucky in a, in a way that we reached that. So there were 42% of the patients dry after three days with the cetazolamide. P value highly statistically significant, relative risk reduction of 46%. There was absolutely no interaction with any of the predefined subgroups. As you could see, elderly, ejection fraction, anti pro BNP, sex, they all favored the cetazolamide group. Now, very importantly, what was the decongestion rate at discharge? Because you might think, you know, I don't use a cetazolamide, I give a thiazide, or I do something else and I don't listen to ad for, and I'll make it up. You know, I don't need it. So that's why we also analyzed at discharge. So the investigators did a pretty good job. They had 62% of the patients dry at the moment of discharge. But in the cetazolamide arm, they had almost 80% dry. Number needed to treat of six. So only six patients needed to be treated for three days with the cetazolamide to have this spectacular improvement in decongestion rates at discharge. Again, these were double blinded, uh, this was a double blinded trial. Eh? So this means that you cannot make it up. And why is that? 
there is an incremental benefit of azetazolamide over consecutive days. The incremental benefit I know it now from the several SIP analysis is not so much the benefit of acetazolamide per se, but it's the prevention, the prevention of loop diuretic resistance. It's the prevention, Jeff, of more and more sodium reabsorption in the proximal parts of the kidney. And that drives the problem. And acetazolamide is now the only drug which has proven that it can prevent diuretic resistance far better than giving just loop diuretic in monotherapy. When we looked at diuresis and natriuresis, there was a tremendous increase in natriuresis over the first two days. We, didn't not, we did not measure that during three days. We did urine collections during the first two days. A lot more natriuresis than diuresis. <clears throat> when we looked at secondary endpoints predefined, length of stay was significantly reduced with one day, which is important for healthcare related costs but also for quality of life, but we did not reduce all cause mortality and heart failure rehospitalization. Bear in mind that our trial was, of course, underpowered to do so, and this is a diuretic trial. This is not a trial which, has, which, uh, which needed to show long-term outcomes. This was just a trial to show that you can reach more effective decongestion. <clears throat> we did a SARS uh, COVID sensitivity analysis, which showed that there was no influence of COVID on the primary endpoint. There was also no difference in the utilization of loop diuretics between the two groups. And there was a little bit of increase in MRA use in the acetazolamide treated patients. What about safety? There was zero signal of harm when we looked at the trial. There was no increase in renal endpoints. There was no increase in hypotension. There was no increase in severe metabolic acidosis or hypokalemia. And also bear in mind that the drug has been used for more than 70 years. So I think it has shown a safety profile over the last decades. Now, I, I know there's a lot of comments about our exclusion criterion to exclude STLD2 inhibitors. And we specifically excluded this in the trial. Why was that? Well, the trial started in 2016, and at that moment, there was absolutely zero um, data that SLD2 inhibitors should be used in heart failure. Well, however, at that moment, we already published a review stating that these, are, that these were very promising agents for heart failure because they also work in the proximal part of the kidney. But we, there was no indication, and we wanted to prevent a disbalance in the two treatment groups for these drugs. Now, if you look at the uh, mechanism of effect of SGLD2 inhibitors in the proximal tubule, they block glucose uptake, and that glucose sodium channel is only responsible for 5% of the sodium uptake, which is completely different from acetazolamide. So if anything, then these drugs will work synergistically, but not mutually exclusive. When you look at all the trials with SGLD2 inhibitors, they, are, they show that you have an increase in diuresis, but not so much an increase in natriuresis. So should they use, be used in combination? Absolutely. Should SGLT2 inhibitors be used as a diuretic agent? I don't think so, but they should be used in all heart failure patients chronically. And acetazolamide is a diuretic agent, which is completely different. So these are our conclusions. I think EDFOR was the largest diuretic trial in acute heart failure ever performed with a very important clinical endpoint. EDFOR was the first trial in acute heart failure with a positive endpoint. It showed that the addition of 500 milligrams of acetazolamide to standardized IV loop diuretic therapy was associated with a 46% higher incidence of decongestion. The benefit was consistent across all pre-specified subgroups and the three patients treated with acetazolamide had more natriuresis, had a shorter hospital stay, and were more likely to be discharged without volume overload. Again, number needed to treat of six, eh? not 20, not 100, only six. There was no reduction in all cause mortality or heart failure hospitalization, but the trial was underpowered to do so, and the rates of these endpoints were considerably lower than was, re was reported in those. Although our patients were sicker, the rates were considerably lower. There was no higher incidence of adverse events, and the results highlight the importance to target congestion early 
and they also further support the use of natriuresis as an indicator of diuretic response. And we feel that at first support the utilization of this drug as it is a cheap drug. It costs eight euros a day, eight, not 800. It's off patent. It's very easy to use once daily, it's safe, and it turned out to be very effective to improve decongestion. And if you look at our HF or our ESC guidelines, these are the guidelines with diuretic therapy. So loop therapies have a class one. Thiaz has a class two A indication. Again, I refer to the class one with loop diuretics, although we don't really have data for that. So it, it makes us wonder, of course, how is ESC going to position the use of acetazolamide? This is what we think of. This is, not, of course, not this is not a guideline, and this is just what I made up. Acetazolamide on top of loop diuretics might be recommended for patients with acute heart failure who are admitted to fluid overload who were previously treated with oral loop diuretics to improve the incidence of decongestion. Class B, because we have one randomized control trial, and then it should be one or two A, depending on the voting committee of the guidelines. The data has been published now in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I also would like to emphasize that out of the six first orders, five of them are PhD students. So this is really supports, uh, should support the young people there, or even younger than, than I am, that even if you're young and really motivated that you can get to the New England Journal of Medicine. So this, I think, was a little bit the slogan that we're trying to emphasize during the ESC meeting, door to combo diuretic time. And I think we have proven now that acetazolamide is the only agent which has shown a positive endpoint with regards to decongestion. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open for any questions you might still have. Thanks so much, Dr. Mullins. That was great. Um, we have uh, a number of people on the call today. So um, if you'd like to ask any questions, please just feel free to unmute yourself or you could uh, place your question in the chat uh, if, if you'd like and I could read it to Dr. Mullins or I'll raise your hand and uh, I will call on you. So um, I see Jeff is ready to go first. <laughs> well, for fantastic stuff. Uh... Really a, a big advance, um, as you said, biggest diuretic trial. It's, it's really great to see it published and and, uh, and embraced by the community as, as it has been. So the one thing that's been puzzling me is the, 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 the trends, though obviously not powered at all for death and rehospitalization, but why did they trend in the wrong direction? And, and it, this was really easy for me to blow off when I first see it, but then of course, I'm sure you've seen the chlorotic results where they had, you know, totally different mechanism, et cetera, but they had more decongestion there as well. And again, trend towards more death and rehospitalization. And, you know, I've been on the podium for the last 10 years saying, if you decongest people more, they're gonna do better. Um, and we have two trials, the first two trials now that actually have caused more reduction in fluid during the in-hospital setting, yet neither trended. I mean, both trended in the wrong direction, not the right direction. So, so any, any thoughts on that? Yes and no. I, I don't think, Jeff, that a short-term acting agent like acetazolamide will translate in longer-term prognos prognostic effects. I think we have to look at this as a diuretic trial, which, which we use to in a daily life to try to decongest patients better. Patients come in with fluid overload. They come, that's their main complaint. They don't complain that they will die within the five years. They complain about fluid overload. And we don't really have a good therapy to, to, to treat, to, to, to do that. And I think this, this, this should be seen as diuretic agents. And I think we should add SCLT2 as soon as possible because that will translate in a better outcome. But I think we're, we're, we're expecting too much from acute heart failure trials where we give short-term acting agents um, to improve long-term outcomes. And it, of course, it puzzles me, and of course, we would have hoped that it also would have trended towards the, the right direction. But for now, I think it's it's also play of chance. I know, for example, I know now which patients were allocated to cetazolamide in my center. I didn't know it then. And when I looked at the ones who died, they just came in in like a pre-shock condition with really GFRs of 22, just above the base, just above the... So if, they, if we wouldn't have included those three, the trend would, be, would have been the other way around. So it's also play of luck if you only, the numbers are really low here, we're talking about that. 
The second thing is, and I never tell that, but I can share it with you. If you look at in-hospital mortality, this was statistically significantly better for the acetazolamide group. So the in-hospital mortality was, I'm not saying reduced because that's wrong, but if, if you ask me, it's reduced, that's even significantly with the cetazolamide. But I'm not gonna say that, I'm gonna say it now, but I'm never gonna write it somewhere because I don't think that's fair. But the same comment comes from Greg Fonero, you know, it goes in the right, wrong direction. So, you know, it's a 500 trial. There are not a lot of mortalities here. Look at what you're, I mean, not you, what, what, what we all are doing acute heart failure. We have 50% mortality hospitalization after two months. We, we barely have 28%. Eh? We're doing a great job, I think, with this trial. So if you look at it from in, in perspective, I don't really see a signal of harm. But I understand the comment eh? that if you dive deep dive into the trial, you see, you know, there's nothing wrong here. There yeah, I, no I, I, wrong. I, don't, I don't think any of us see harm. It's just like, you know, if, if you would have asked me beforehand, if we have a, you know, this big reduction in residual congestion, we're kind of at least see a rehospitalization trend, maybe yeah, not significant, but. But Jeff, these, we're, still, we're still analyzing this, of course, but these patients are 78 years of age. So about 18% has rehospitalized after three months. If you're 78 with a GFR of 40 and you have a less than 20% rehospitalizations after three months, I mean, that's a tremendous good result. Eh? Yeah. I mean, they're, these are not 50 year old people. Eh? These are really elderly, frail people who just come into the hospital for a heart failure related event. That's what, that's what we're showing. We didn't, we didn't say that they came in with a lot, with 10 liters of volume again. Eh? They just came in with a heart failure related event, which might have been atrial fibrillation, which might have been a non stemi which may have been a pneumonia, which caused a little bit of pulmonary edema. That's what we're saying. We, did, we don't. We're, so we have to delve a little bit more into this to solve this problem, but it's not that they're coming back with 10 kilograms of volume again. Great. But I get the point. So I think we just need to redo this in the US where everybody leaves super congested and comes back, you know, half the time in six months. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, you also have to look at, at the, the recongest, the decongest at discharge. Eh? I mean, people are staying in hospital for nine days. Eh? And I know a lot of people in the US say, yeah, if we would have kept them nine days, it would also have been in drug. Yeah, I mean, that's our job. Eh? And I know the system is against you to keep them longer in the hospital. Those nine days, on average, they were dry after five to six days. The three additional days is also social reasons. Many of these people are elderly. You take them into the hospital, they get a little bit confused. People, the families say, I cannot take them home. And then they stay a couple of days more in the hospital, which is, of course, not correct. But that's the way healthcare systems are still set up in, in, in our countries. We have a question in the chat and then I, I saw Lavi unmute herself as well. Um, I'll ask the question real quickly here then Lavi, I don't know if you have a question, maybe you can go after this one. Um, uh, in the chat it says, asks if there's any differences in electrolyte disturbances or a higher need for electrolyte correction in the acetazolamide group. Um, the, the, the second thing I cannot answer because we didn't collect that, but I know there was a little bit more if you, because we, what we collected was the, the ions. So we know there's a little bit more hypokalemia in the acetazolamide group, but I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. That might just mean that they're just being out more because of the, the combination of the, of the diuretic agents that look arrays are more effective. But we don't we we didn't collect the number of um, let's say chloride infusions that was not captured. But when we just looked the, at the lab, absolute values were a little bit lower in the cetazolamide group. For a bicarbonate, there was there was no statistically significant difference. No. And Wilford, you guys, it's a it's five hundred of of diamox with a gram of mag, correct? Yeah. So the magnesium. I know the question also comes up. So we gave the magnesium. Um, not because we thought it needed to be, but that's just common practice in Belgium centers. Most of us have been trained in one center, which is Leuven, and there they used to give it. So everybody took this for granted. So initially we asked to the investigator, do you give something? And most of them said, yeah, we give a little bit of glucose and some magnesium. And that's why we put it in the protocol. So both groups, I'm not even saying they received it. We, we told the investigators, it's okay that you give this, but don't give them so, if you give anything, give that as a fluid. 500 cc of glucose with some magnesium. And for the rest, we didn't uh, recommend anything. 
Do you have a subset that didn't get mag? I'm just curious if, you know, because in the US, no one does that. And I'm wondering, yeah. you know, is there some sort of magic synergy with diamoxin no, and mag? No idea. We don't even know how many people got it. This was just a recommendation that, that another recommendation was just, if you give something, you can do this. You don't have to tell us, but you're not allowed to give sodium chloride. Makes sense. So Lavi had to jump off to do some uh, clinical uh, care, but her question was, um, why do you think the decongestion was so good in the placebo group with higher risk patients with higher BNP and older age? Yeah, I, I think it's a, yeah, I understand the question. So it was almost double of those. It's also, I think, first of all, we looked at other signs of congestion than those. We looked at volume overload. Yeah, well, those was also, also as JVP, which is very difficult clinically to be very honest. So we were looking at volume overload. Second uh, answer to that is I, I don't think patients come in as volume overloaded anymore as they used to be doing 10 years ago, especially not in Europe, because access to care is pretty easy, especially in Belgium. So most patients come in in Belgium with five, six kilograms of excess volume, but not more than that. So I think they have high anti-pro BNPs, yes, but they are less volume overloaded than 10 years ago. And the assessment of congestion in our trial is different than it was in those. What's planned with the uh, the biosamples? Uh, you, if you uh, submit a proposal, we can look at it, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a plan yet. No, we don't have a plan yet. But the, the, the sub-analysis with, um, with bicarbonate is extremely intriguing. The higher the bicarbonate you have when you when you're admitted, it's a, it's a basically an indication of neuromonal stimulation, and mm -hmm. it's especially those patients that react really well to cetazolamide, because it there does. you're gonna absorb more sodium in the proximal part, and it's it's, it's really intriguing. Yeah. So and I, I, I missed the, I missed I missed the slide. How many patients did you say ended up in the in the biorepository? Excuse me. How many? How many patients were in the biorepository? In in the, in the trial. Uh, no, in the, in the uh, it was only a subset that got the biorepository, right? Uh, the biomarkers, about 130. Yeah, we didn't. 130. Oh, that's yeah. a nice, so, nice, yeah. uh, nice end. Yeah, but in those we have urines, we have blood, we have everything in those. Yeah, that's great. Another question in the chat: um, in the in the event that a patient would not respond to IV loop diuretic plus IV cetazolamide, uh, and you needed to move to a third agent to try to. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. block the nephron, what would be your choice of agent? SGLT2 inhibitor or thiazide or, you know, something? Uh, I think SGLT2 is clear. I would give it to everybody. So I, I don't see it that as a diuretic, although it also will help to decongest, of course, via neuromonal inhibition. Um, so I would give that to everybody. So that's not for me a diuretic agent anymore. But if you don't get there with titrated uh, loop diuretics, uh, based on the algorithm that we have to increase the dosages three times a day, with the cetazolamide once I'm at the done, I probably will also add a thiazide. I'm not against thiazides. Huh? I'm just in favor of a drug which is now shown unequivocally that it helps. And with thiazides, we just have the observation that we think it helps. We know there is harm if you give it too long, and this is not the case for cetazolamide. But I get why a lot of people give thiazides, but I think you should change your practice based on the evidence now or at least try with, with the drug which is shown to be more effective. For what it's worth, anecdotally, I've made use of, of acetazolamide much more frequently since your paper came out and I've had great success with my patients. Mm -hmm. um, any other uh, questions or comments out there from the group? Okay, well, uh, Dr. Mullins, again, thank you so much for taking the time. I know we know it's approaching 10 o'clock PM there in Belgium and uh, uh, happy that you made the time to share this with us and um, we wish you all the best and I hope that we get to meet in person sometime down the road. It's a pleasure. Great to see you, Wilford, take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.